Once again, I never realized how hard it is to not want to sing, or to not sing. I was literally clenching my teeth all the time. So I, I wanted to sing, but I didn't know what to do. And uh, big props to Catherine for uh, stepping up this morning. I don't think you guys know how hard it is to play and sing at the same time. Um, some of the songs we had rehearsed her needing to sing on. And so the last minute she had to step up and lead the singing. So thank you for stepping up on that. I know it's a pretty But <laughs> we are uh, finally into our text of Romans today. Um, uh, it's really, it's been, I'll be honest, it's been a, a joyful week just to get into this. It's been a lot of fun, uh, just to be honest. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm really excited about getting into this, into this letter. Um, you guys know there's uh, some people that are really talkative. They're pretty, pretty wordy <laughs> people. Not Cheryl. They like to, they, they talk a lot. And, and uh, uh, let's see, there's you know, a lot of those here in French Gulf. So that's, that's fun. <laughs> um, you know, but... Um, you know, I don't want any finger pointing or names being said. You know, the next thing like, say, you know some people really talk a lot, but they never really say much. Um, and, and you kind of, you know, some of those people maybe. And so, and so you're kind of like, oh, it's great listening to you, but what, what are you really saying? And what, what's here for it? Um, there's a lot, I think a lot of us are kind of falling in, in, in between. So, you know, we talk a lot, and we have something to say. It's not really a lot to say, I'll be honest, I'll fall into that. Then there's, I don't know, there's some people that are talk a lot, but everything they say is like good. You know, it's like I, I think those people are really uh, kind of uh, few and far between, uh, yeah. are very talkative. But everything they say is like so, so good. And so you, you don't mind, you know, listening to them. Um, you know, and and. Uh, that's kind of how Paul gets in a lot of his writings, uh, the Apostle Paul. Because um, here in the beginning is just a greeting. The first seven verses is just simply a greeting. Um, but he expounds greatly on it, which he does in a lot of his letters. Um, but he, this is his biggest, <laughs> the longest uh, greeting that he has. Um, he he, he kind of does it like if, if artists today... Uh, um, their greeting, they would introduce themselves first and, and, and say uh, a greeting or to who they're writing it to and then a greeting. So like if I would say, I'm Jake to Vern, greetings. That's a nice short to the point light way of saying, right? This is Paul's way of saying, if I put myself in Paul's shoes. I, Jake Licklider of Kansas, growing on a farm, went to the Air Force, called to be a pastor, went through school, but there, and, and I could add on letters and letters and, and, and phrases and everything on that. And that's how Paul writes. Then he'll finally get to the next stage. Vernon, a miner, living in French Gulch, and expound on that. <laughs> then he'll say, greetings to you. And, and he'll expound on that. That's how Paul writes. And so when, when, you, when you look at the letters of Paul, it's, it's fun to... It's because it's like a puzzle. I don't know. I sound like a Greek geek right now. I'm a, I'm a Greek geek, okay? Um, of trying to piece it all together of all these phrases that, that Paul uses um, without, with, with only a few nouns and trying to figure out what's, what's he, what is he talking about here? What's that modifying? What's it really relating to? So it's a big puzzle. Um, that's where his letters are so fun in that. Uh, it leads a lot of discussion among scholars, too, about. Which phrase is that? Which noun is this phrase modifying? You know, because that can change how things go. Oh, and that's what we have here in the first uh, seven uh, verses of Romans. That's all we're going to look at today is the first seven. <clears throat> and we're going to read uh, here, you know, Paul, he's going to introduce himself by, by his divine calling. Um, he's going to explain uh, the, the message he's been given in verses two through four. Um, and then he's going to get to the specific job that he has, verses 5 through 6. Um, so if you've got your Bibles, let's turn them open to Romans 1. 
Um, if you're not already there, it's, of course, after all the Gospels um, and Acts. And then Romans. Romans chapter 1. And it begins, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, this is where he finally says hello, <laughs> grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot in there. And uh, depending on translation, that is all one sentence. That's all one thought. Okay? <laughs> That's Paul for you. He gets very verbose in his writings and it, it makes it a lot of fun to decipher. Um, so really, if you strip everything away, you'll say, Paul, to those in Rome, grace and peace to you. <laughs> That's the, 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 <laughs> the three parts he's saying. Of course, he adds a lot of verses to that. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the verses and then we're going to come through some uh, new questions for our application. I'm going to walk through them. It starts out with verse 1. Paul, he identifies himself, a servant of Christ. Um, now here, um, in Greek, this, there's the same word means servant and slave, doulos. It's slave and servant, so depending on your translation, we have slave there. And I really think that slave is actually a kind of a better term. That's what Paul really pushes in a lot of his letters, the fact that he is a slave of Christ. Now this is where, and if you come to our Wednesday Night Bible Studies, we'll, we've talked about this. We hear the word slave as Americans, and our immediate, our immediate thought of slave is obviously the South, right? Civil War, or yeah, Civil War time. You think of so the slave trade ships bringing slaves from Africa over to the Americas and, and the horrible brutality that happened with that slavery. Um, that's the kind of slavery we have in mind. I mean, let's be honest, that's our culture, that's what we understand slavery to be. Um, but slavery back then, especially among the Jews, was vastly different. It was vastly different. Um, there was actually an exception, uh, instructions in the Mosaic Law for what to do about slaves. And how it's given gives you a picture of how these slaves were, these slaves were treated. Exodus 21, 2-6. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free. So is this a, a necessarily a lifetime sentence of slavery? No. Uh, he'll go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, so she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her daughter shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. So there's an allowance for these slaves to get out free. But if they love their master, they, they don't have a problem with where they're at, guess what? They can become, and, and, and it's a consecration before God. You shall bring him to God. It's just, this is a consecration. This, this is a lifetime service now. So slavery is a totally different thing. I mean, yes, in Roman times there were bad slaves. I mean, we even had the slave revolt led by by a Spartacus, or, uh, or, or I forgot the actor's name, Douglas. Uh, Kurt. Kurt Douglas, thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> Sparty, we do, we do have that, but that was not what Paul was addressing. These slaves were much more well treated. Um, and, and even if you were, um, the, the slavery was more, um, if you were a, a, a slave in a 
low, low household, you, know, you didn't have much influence. But if you were a slave of a, of a powerful house, you had a lot of influence. Uh, there was a lot going on. You had a high standing. Uh, there's even, uh, I was reading uh, oh, a few years ago about a, a very influential Roman senator named Cicero. Uh, he had a slave named Tiro who invented shorthand. Um, the shorthand, I mean, I mean, he created the whole aspect of shorthand. But Tiro, man, he was, even though he was a slave of Cicero, he was a powerful person. He could walk in any household with the power of Cicero. He, he, he was not treated uh, badly. He was highly educated. But he was a slave. So, when we read the word slave of Christ, don't think of American slavery. You've got to put us, go back to what slavery was back then. It was even among the Mosaic Law. There was, there was an out for the slave to get out free. And if the slave was happy with where he was, he, 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 was, he, was, he could serve there for the rest of his life. So I think slave is a, is a good term. Even though it kind of makes us you know, a little uncomfortable to hear that word. But a slave, if you're a slave of someone, you show total devotion to your master. You show humility towards your master. You obey your master, your owner, who owns you. And that really defines our relationship with Jesus. And that's who first Paul, first, the first thing he calls himself is a slave of Christ. That's a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle called to be an apostle. This is called from God. This is not him earning the position. This is a direct calling from God. An apostle literally means messenger. Uh, and that's what he was doing here. Um, but here, um, when you see the word apostle, we got to put two different uses on it for our modern day understanding. Um, there's a big A, apostle, I mean, the office of apostle, and that is people, the, the original disciples and Paul who, who witnessed you know, Jesus physically and saw him, was with them, and then was specifically called to be an apostle. Uh, that's the office of apostle, big A. Um, and there's uh, some churches, actually, they're, nowadays they're trying to kind of recreate, uh, saying we can own an office, but that's an office a position just for these early, early Christians. Uh, then there's the little a apostle, messengers, and also where the New Testament refers to us being messengers of God, apostles of God. But here, uh, Paul is talking about apostle, big, big A for, for us. Um, he, he called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Set apart. And it's, it's, when you say set apart, it's not to be, you know, uh, isolated, to be away from the world. It's just that while you're in the world, you have a, a separate thing. Remember, Paul made tents, he made a living, he mingled with the, the pagans and the Gentiles. Um, but the whole time he was set apart, uh, had a special, a special calling. I think the, the, the call to be an apostle and set apart um, uh, reflects back on that apostleship. It shows a commitment, a dedication in his life. You now he's called, he's set apart. In verse 2, which he promised, which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Promised beforehand. Well, remember, in the Roman church, there's both Jew and Gentiles in the church. So this here is referring to beforehand through his prophets. So in the Holy Scriptures, remember Holy Scriptures refers to the Old Testament, because they didn't have the New Testament yet. Um, so he's talking about the, the gospel was spoken about through the prophets. He's appealing to the, the Jewish side. Uh, in the Holy Scriptures, uh, and this is a little different. Um, it's kind of weird. This is the only time that phrase Holy Scriptures is used in the New Testament. Uh, they'll, they'll use other words. But this is the only time we have Holy Scriptures given in the New Testament. And what, and what, what did the, the Scriptures speak about? Concerning His Son. Concerning His Son. So God's Son, now we're appealing to His 
his, 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 his deity, his son who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. By his resurrection, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. See here, we have Paul pointing, remember Jesus was fully God and fully man. And here, Paul is pointing to both of those. He's saying, yes, he, was, he came from the flesh, from David. But he's pointing back to that Davidic throne, that Messiah that, that the Jews were hoping for and longing for to have someone come. And he was descended from David according to the flesh. And then verse 4, he, he goes on, he's declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection. Now, those are all uh, phrases that we've got to put together. He was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection. So if you have to piece that together, well, hopefully, you might not be thinking, declared to be the Son of God, I mean he wasn't the Son of God before? Now, this is when he's recognized, when he enters his power, when, he, when he's crowned the, that, that Davidic throne, is at his resurrection. That's when he came into his power. Um, it's at that. So it's not that he just now is the Son of God, but I think the, the uh, New Living Translation has a good phrase, was shown to be the Son of God. I like that phrasing. It's not exactly to the Greek, but it's a better phrasing to understand what, what they're saying in there. That he was shown to be the Son of God. He's revealed in his power at, at his resurrection. He's declared to be the Son of God in power. And this is a new thing. And then this new power given to Jesus from the Father. Because then in linking in power, Paul's going to talk, it's called Jesus Christ our Lord, adding a new title he gives. He's the Lord. As the, at the resurrection, Jesus transitions from not just being the Son as Messiah, but the Son as both the Messiah and the powerful Lord, the powerful reigning Lord. This is some key things about who Christ is that he's talking about here. According to the spirit of holiness. This this is where he's contrasting, if not, in verse 3, he said, according to the flesh. And here he says, according to the spirit of holiness. So now he's contrasting that fully God, fully man aspect of Christ. Remember, that if you read, if you read Paul, the contrast between flesh and spirit is a common theme uh, throughout Paul. And he does it a lot. And this is what he's pointing to it as well. <laughs> but this spirit of holiness is also a, another uh, unique phrase that is only used here. Um, I think a couple of translations might put Holy Spirit, but most of them stick to spirit of holiness because it's a slightly different word than we use for Holy Spirit. Spirit of holiness. So he's pointing to that, the flesh and God part of, of, of Christ. Um, but it also points to the role of the Holy Spirit and it, its role in Christ's resurrection and the coronation of Christ as Lord. There's a lot going on in here as uh, what's going on with what he's talking about, who Christ is. He was descended from David at his resurrection. He came into, in, into power as the Son of God. And he's now Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now he's been talking about Jesus and who Jesus is. Now in verse 5, he's going to um, come back uh, and go back to his role. And he says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. We have received grace and apostleship. Obviously the first question he's asking is, who's the we? Who's the we? Is, 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 he, is he meaning the, the Christians in Rome? And us, if he means the Christians in Rome, then to us, are we called into apostleship? And I think he's talking about that first century office of the apostles still. See, I don't think it's the we. I don't think the we includes us. 
His Father on whom we have received. I think he's referring to the apostleship in general at that time, the other apostles. We have received grace and, and, and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. And in verse 6 he says, including you. See, he, he now refers to the Christians in Rome totally different from the we. So that's why when he says we, he's not referring to us. He's not referring to the Christians in Rome. He's referring to those first century apostles that, uh, that uh, occupied, that were the big A apostles, the, the, those true apostles who had the calling, who had the mission to really get out there and spread the word initially. Um, because then in verse 6, he refers to the Christians of Rome as to include the, that the apostles were called to, to go to them. Um, so I think when we read, we have seed, we, we don't want to jump in too soon and put ourselves there. Oh, we, we're there. No, no. Let's look at the context that's going on there. We, we aren't part of that apostleship. That's a special, a, a special apostleship for Paul and the other apostles in the first century. So he's saying, he's going back to his job, to whom we, the apostles, have received grace. Received grace. The free gift of God to be an apostle. Received grace and apostleship. And to do what? what what's some aspects of the apostleship? And what's interesting is, um, it's hard. There's actually no verbs here in the Greek. So even though our English translations will put in kind of the to be verbs, action verbs, there's actually not that going on. This is the different aspects of his apostleship. And one of the aspects is to bring about the obedience of faith. Bring about, and I like, uh, ESV uses to bring about, the translation uses for or to, which I think is a better, um, for the obedience of faith. If you, if, these are another two words that Paul uses a lot. Obedience and faith. He uses them a lot together. It's obedience and faith, and they always go together. Obedience always involves faith, and faith always involves obedience. They go together. Another aspect of his apostleship is that to be among the nations. Um, and that word is ethnos. It really, uh, Gentiles is, is, a, is a better because just uh, down in verse 13, he uses the same exact word at the end of the verse, for, you know, as among the rest of the Gentiles. Uh, so it should be Gentiles. Among all the Gentiles, including you, as you pointing to Rome. Remember, Paul pointed a lot to the, one of the aspects of his apostle. What he was called to was to reach the Gentiles. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. That was one of the main roles of Paul. And this is where he's pointing that out. In verse 6, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about the Christians in Rome. He had previously appealed to the Jews in the church when he said he's preaching a gospel that is rooted in the Old Testament. Now he's saying, I'm also the apostle to the Gentiles, including you Gentiles, you Christians in Rome who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And once again, he uses that called to belong. Those are some key words. <laughs> it isn't us doing the calling. It's Christ Jesus who calls us. So he's finally now, he's taking all this time to talk about himself. <laughs> And who he is and what, what message he's talking about and why he's doing it. Now he's going to finally get to the greeting. To all those in Rome. To all those in Rome. These are two characteristics he gives here. In Rome who are loved by God. And um, the Greek literacy says called saints. Not called to be, but you are called saints. So you those in Rome who are loved by God and called saints. You are loved by God. And what does saint mean? I mean, it literally means holy one. The holy ones, if you put the, the, uh, 
fit the plural there. And what does holy mean? It means set apart. You're set apart for God's purpose. So if you are a saint, you're a holy one, one that is set apart for God's purpose. It means two words, being that you're loved by God and that you are called saints. It reminds us of two things here. Who we are depends on God's love and God's call. That's the main thing. This term saint, Paul uses 38 times. He uses it a lot in reference to Christians. Uh, and when he writes about it, his focus isn't on behavior. When he says saints, it's the focus is on the status as a saint. Christians are those who have been sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. And thus, saints. Unfortunately, the word saint has kind of been, you know, the Catholic Church has twisted it and then they, you know, to elevate people to be a saint. You know, we have all the saints out there. And unfortunately, that, that is not a biblical office. That, that, that's not the meaning that Paul has here for saint. Um, and and, 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 and what, why is someone elevated to the office of saint in the Catholic Church? Because of what they did, Right? But is that what Paul points to at all? No, it's got nothing to do with action. It's your standing. I mean, just think of how, how we uh, use saint in our everyday life. Oh, you're such a saint. Someone says that to you. What, what are they referring to? Some action that you did. Or how you treated them. And, and so we have this mind of, of saint is about action. That's not how Paul uses it. It's about your standing before God. It's not about what we do. See, the main thrust of this opening passage is on Christ. Paul points out that Jesus is the heart of the gospel. He is the promised Messiah of Israel, the God, the Son of God, the Lord. Now, for us today, we must continually make sure we acknowledge this exalted and high view of Jesus. We often love to say Jesus is our friend and our companion. But no, he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. We need to also make sure we are recognizing that aspect. But Paul also points to the activity of Jesus through here. How Jesus came to the earth as the Messiah. He is exalted through his resurrection to, to Lord of all. He, he's dispensing his power as the, the Son of God. It is what Jesus has done, not just who he is, that makes the gospel the good news that it is. Now, in this passage, let me just turn myself off. Let's put my hand on the In this passage, there's a lot of verbs going on here. A lot of verbs. But in studying this, there isn't a single verb in here that we're responsible for. The closest one is where Paul says we have received. But Paul's referring to the apostles and what, what are they doing? Receiving from the Lord. They're not doing anything. Every single verb in this passage is focused on God. On Jesus and on the Holy Spirit. We are loved by God and called to be saints because of the work of Jesus, not our own work. So here's my closing questions for you. Who are you? Are you a slave to Jesus? Who is your master? We all have one, whether we acknowledge it or not. You know, our own personal reasoning, our own intellect can be our master and what we, we seek after. Money can be what we seek after. Our job, family can even come that, become our master. Fear, worry, addiction, all of those can be what we are slave to. These are not what we are called to be. I mean, we, we, the last couple of weeks we sang the new song, we, we're no longer slaves. Remember that chorus? We're no longer slaves to fear. I am a child of God. That's such a good statement. You know, another great biblical statement, because that chorus comes right out of Romans 8. 
It won't have the same ring to us, but say, I am no longer a slave to fear. I'm a slave to Jesus. <laughs> we have something as our Lord and Master. Instead of something that will just <laughs> tear us apart, let's come and serve Jesus with total devotion, with humility, and utter dependence on Jesus and no one else. I mean, what did Jesus say? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That we have a yoke. We are going to be yoked to someone. Remember, that's what that goes over the top of cows and leads them around. We can be yoked to this world, to culture, to whatever else, or we can be yoked to Jesus and take on his burden and become a slave to him and serve him with total devotion, really, and dependence. Do you know that you are loved by God? Our world is full of so much hate these days. People's self-image and, and self-esteem, and especially among the younger generation, that they're lower than ever before. Depression is, is, is rampant. There's so much going on. And we think we have to earn any love that we get. But that isn't what God has done. We love because he first loved us. We are loved not by, we are loved by him not because of our actions. Uh, because really, if, if, if God's love towards us depended on our actions, we, we would have been wiped out a long time ago. <laughs> we don't deserve anything. We are not loved by God because of our actions, but by the actions of his one and only beloved son, Jesus. Our minds, our, our sin, the, the enemy will, will tell us we're not good enough to be loved by God. The next time you think that, the next time you hear somebody say that, I want you to answer, yeah. <laughs> I'm not good enough to be loved by God. I'm not. But because of Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, because God so loved the world, he sent his only son to die for me. Yeah, now I can, now I can be loved by God. I'm not good enough. I never will be. Last question. Do you know you are a saint? Not because of what you've done, because of what Christ has done. You are a holy one, set apart by God for his purpose. Does your life reflect that truth? Does how you view your life, how you view your purpose, how you view your identity reflect that you've been set apart by God for his purpose? You know, this isn't saying y'all got to become pastors and teachers. No, it's just, remember, Paul is talking to a church filled with people of all different walks of life. So wherever you are, wherever you are living, is your life reflecting that you, you who acknowledge Jesus as Lord, have a new purpose in life? In your job, are you living your, are you doing your job as a holy one? as a saint, in your family, in your friends, in your neighborhood, are you living as a holy one set apart by God? And we're, when my time in the Air Force, you know, it's mostly all, uh, a lot of men, and, and it's easy to fall into the, the rumor mill of what's going on, or, you know, we get together here, let's go uh, chatting, you know, especially on Mondays, talking about the football games over the weekend, and and chat and having them things. But then invariably someone would start leading the conversation off into not good things. The language might become start to become questionable. And I, I just walk away from them. That's not what God has called me to be. I'll love on them, be in the room, my friends, and, and talk about things. But when it goes for something I should not be a part of, because I have been called for a different purpose than to talk about the one night stands and all this stuff. I don't want to be a part of that. I'll walk away from it. It's so easy to just follow others and be a part of the crowd, but that's not what God has called us to be. 
Do your job with a new identity as a saint, a holy one. In your family, don't fall back into old ways. I struggle with that. When, I, when you, you get back with family, you fall back, and now you've always been. And, and I admit, and there's times I don't act like a saint when I'm with my family. <laughs> so I have to consciously think about, hey, I am set apart. I need to be different. Live a life that reflects your identity as a holy one. Set apart by God to fulfill his purpose which is to share the good news with those around you. Now, can we honestly say that in all three, I'm 100% living out exactly all three of all these identities? No. <laughs> That's what I hope right now, though, is that the Spirit is moving you. And that maybe there's one of these aspects that you're kind of drawn to, that the Spirit, your conscience, is, is turning the screws a little bit on. And if you're taking notes, I want you to put a little star, a little dash or something next to that. You remember, you think about what's, what, what's the one that is kind of sticking with me right now. I want you to mark it. And then throughout this week, I want you to keep coming back to that. Be in prayer over that. And say, Lord, change me, mold me. Help me find my identity in that. Maybe I, I struggle with really obeying Christ. And obeying the word of God. I need to focus on being a slave to Jesus and really acknowledge him as my Lord and Master. Maybe I struggle with self-image and self-esteem. I struggle with feeling worthless. Focus on that you are loved by God. Maybe you struggle living a life that is different from those around you. But you just kind of follow other people and do things you really, you, 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 in the back of your mind, you know you shouldn't be doing what you should do. You should focus on living a life of a saint. So, I pray that you would just focus on that this week. What do we need to bring before the Lord? And as we close our song, Jesus paid it all. And I want you to pray about what God is working on you with. Whatever course the Holy Spirit takes you, remember that. We can do it not because of our merit, of our accomplishments, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Let us pray. Father, we do come before you and we just thank you for your, your holy word. Lord, thank you for the excellent truths laid out by Paul, just in the greeting, laying out such excellent truths. Father, I pray that we would live lives that reflect that we're a slave to Christ, and that is not a bad thing. That's a great thing. Lord, that we would know deepest in our roots and our identity that we are loved by you. And Lord, that you, you call us saints, holy ones, set apart for your purpose. Father, I pray we find our identity in these truths. Lord, help us to work in this now. Not forget uh, what we feel now, what we feel the prompting to be now. Don't forget it on Monday or Tuesday. And keep it on our, our minds, Lord. Help it to mold our life. Lord, we ask everything in Jesus' name. Amen.